that must mean it's time to start. Um, we are at 7 o'clock, or just after 7 o'clock, so we will get going. We want to definitely stay on time tonight for everything that we're doing. So first off, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for coming out to this uh, uh, Tabor Warner forum that we have here tonight. I appreciate your attendance, and I absolutely also appreciate our candidates for being here tonight and taking the time to be here with us. My name is Ken Holst, and I will be the moderator for tonight's forum. And uh, we are looking forward to being able to get some good discussion and some good questions uh, going, and uh, I know there will be good answers. So we're going to start uh, in uh, alphabetical order, just announcing and introducing our three candidates that are here tonight. Um, we have drawn also a, uh, a number selection for how we will start um, the evening with them, but first off, we will announce them in alphabetical order. First to my far left at the far end of the table is Brent Ginther from the Solidarity Movement of Alberta. <laughs> Next in the middle of the table is Paul Hinman, the Wild Rose Loyalty Coalition. And to my immediate left, Grant Hunter from the United Conservative Party. We, uh, unfortunately, uh, we do have three other candidates in this riding, um, and they were unable to be here tonight, and that's Jasmine Hintz from the Alberta NDP, Frank Cast from the Independence Party of Alberta, and Joel Hunt from the Green Party. So unfortunately, they were not able to be with us here tonight. Uh, but we are, again, very thankful for the three that we have here and, and for their commitment to be here. I will just go over um, some rules that we have for tonight so that everyone is aware of those rules and then we can start hearing from our candidates who we really want to hear from and not from me. So each candidate initially, um, when I am done the rules, will be given five minutes to introduce themselves and present who they are, um, a bit about their platform and things that they really want us to hear. So we will give them five minutes. Um, if you do notice as well, anything that we have a timer on tonight, um, we have a timer here. We're great for, um, grateful for Mr. Papananitz here to be able to run this. And uh, we see that there's a traffic light that he has there. And that traffic light will give an indication to people on exactly um, what time is left. So, for example, um, as the candidates have initially five minutes to present to us, at four minutes, Rick will turn on the green light, indicating that there's one minute left. At 4 minutes and 30 seconds, he will turn on the yellow light, indicating there's 30 seconds left. And at 5 minutes, he will turn on the red uh, light. And at that point, I will ask whoever is speaking at that time to, um, to stop what it is that they're saying, and we will move on from there. It is important for us to keep um, those times in order. So following uh, their introduction, we do have some questions that have been submitted directly to them that they have been able to prepare for. There will be two questions that they have received ahead of time, and we will ask them to, um, to answer those questions. After that, um, we do have some questions that were submitted through the Chamber Facebook page. Um, questions were submitted. We had two questions that were submitted through that. We will then ask those questions for those that have submitted, and then following that, we will then open up the microphone, which is here at the center row, for questions from the floor. All questions that are asked um, from the floor, I'll go to there first, you will have one minute, if you choose to come up and ask a question, you'll have one minute to ask that question. And again, that the same things will happen with the light at 30 seconds left, you will be given the green light, at 15 seconds left, you'll be given the yellow light, and at one minute, you'll be given the red light, and hopefully when you see the lights flashing, you'll know that you had to have your questions summed up from that. All of the answers to our questions from our, from our candidates here, whether they are asked through the ones that have been submitted ahead of time, ones that have been submitted through the Facebook page, or ones that you ask here off the floor, they will be given three minutes to respond. Um, and if they are given to a specific person, so if that question is asked to a specific person, then um, someone else can also follow up. So the, the initial question is asked, 
Each candidate will be given three minutes to answer that question. Again, at, um, at two minutes, the green light will go on. At two minutes and 30 seconds, the yellow light will go on. And at three minutes, the red light will go on. And we'll each give them three minutes um, to be able to respond. Unless, of course, a question is deemed to one of the candidates directly. If that happens, we will offer the opportunity for one of the other candidates to also follow up, but they will only be given two minutes to respond. And again, so at one minute, green, one minute and 30, yellow, and at two minutes, red. So if you go over that, you'll hear from me. So if you don't remember exactly which one it is, just watch those lights and you know you'll be given those times. Um, we hope to uh, around 8.30 to start closing up the meeting. So at 8.30, we will then be giving three minutes to each of our candidates to sum up the evening um, around that time, depending on the questions that we have. Could be earlier, could be later. We will um, sum that up and they'll be given three minutes and again, two minutes on green, two, er, two and a half minutes on yellow and three minutes on red to sum up the evening. Um, we ask uh, for the candidates to only respond to one question at a time and for there not to be any debating. This isn't a debate tonight. This is strictly a forum. Okay, so we will go ahead. We did uh, choose an order for them to start tonight. So uh, first we will hear the first five minutes from Brent Ginther, followed by Grant Hunter, and then third will be Paul Hinman, and then we will ask questions from there, and we will change the order um, from that point going forward so that we can each hear from them first, second, and third throughout the night. So Brent, if you could please go with your first five minutes. Thank you. Well, first I'd like to thank everybody for showing up and coming out here. This is uh, my first time ever doing anything like this, so I'll tell you a little bit about me. Um, I was born in the Crow's Nest Pass, but I grew up in Coaldale. That's where I live now. I'm a teacher at R.A. Baker School. 9-11 uh, happened when I was in high school, and I couldn't wait to join the Army. So when I was in grade 12, my last semester, I went and found a recruiter, signed the papers, and wound up uh, with the 1st Battalion, the PPCLI, in Afghanistan in 2006. I took a burst of machine gun fire in the legs there that just about took them right off of me, so I had to come home and start kind of from square one, from scratch, and I started going back to school while still working at uh, the reservist base in Lethbridge. I got my first degree in environmental science and kept working at it and eventually got an ed degree. I met my wife who eventually became a nurse and we started raising a family and we were living our best life. And I was never a politically active guy, but when COVID came and everything happened the way it did, I decided uh, right then and there that you couldn't count on the UCP and nobody else was coming to save me. So I decided I was gonna get off the couch and start fighting back and making a difference. And I originally signed on to be a candidate with the Independence Party and one thing led to another there. They ended up getting rid of the leader without consulting the membership or any of the constituency associations. And I decided that uh, it's kind of hard for me to oppose the conservative government for doing the wrong thing and not standing against their party if I'm gonna do the same thing. And so I signed on with Arthur Pulowski and the Solidarity Movement of Alberta to be one of the 44 candidates. And that brings me to today, sitting before you guys here. So that's a little bit about me. Thank you, Mr. Ginther. Mr. Hunter, please. All right, well, thank you, Ken, and thank you for coming out tonight. Um, I also wanna thank the uh, candidates for stepping forward and uh, putting their names forward. It's not an easy thing to do, especially in politics today. There seems to be a lot of, uh, not as much civility in, in politics as, as there used to be. And so I, I wanted to say thank you to the candidates for putting their names forward. Back in 2015, when I first ran, I uh, remember thinking that it was a very difficult decision to make. Alberta's been good to our family. We've, we've enjoyed our lives here. And uh, to, to, to weigh into politics was maybe a bridge too far, but I got in, got involved in politics, um, and it felt like drinking from a fire hose. There was, uh, there was so much to learn. There were so many things that you had to do and, and so many hats you had to wear. But as I got involved, I realized that politics is about the individual. It's about being able to try to help individuals through issues. And um, 
what I realized over the last eight years that I've been serving in this constituency is that there are certain principles that you have to stay true to. One of the principles that I really feel strongly about is, is that strong individuals come from strong families. Strong families come from strong communities. And strong communities build strong countries and provinces. And I, I have to say that, uh, you know, it's been a real pleasure working with um, this constituency because we, I think that people understand that. We've got amazing people, individuals, we've got amazing families, and we have amazing communities, great leaders in these communities as well. So it has been a pleasure to be able to work over the last eight years. Obviously, the last two years have been really tough. It didn't matter what you did. You were darned if you do and darned if you don't. And it was tough on, on everybody. I remember thinking that um, after those two years, thinking it's maybe not such a great idea to run again. It felt like eight years in that two years. But there was a project that I was working on in southern Alberta that I felt would really matter to my children and grandchildren and to your children and grandchildren. And that was building out an agri-food processing corridor between Lethbridge and Medicine Hat. And as we worked on that over the last few years, I realized that this can actually make a difference in this area. We already had the start of a super cluster of, of agri-food processors. Atlantic Sugar, and Lamb Weston, McCain's, Cavendish, and many others. But there's so much more we could do. And so as I worked on this project, I realized we need about four more years to be able to actually really get it going. And that's why I'm putting my name forward, to be able to finish this project. The amount of jobs that we will create by getting this done, um, there will be thousands of new jobs, great new business opportunities for people. And there will be opportunities, uh, well, this place, in my opinion, will be the, the most coveted real estate in, in Alberta uh, when we're finished. And so this is what I want to finish. And if I am privileged to be able to receive the vote of Tabor Warner uh, constituents, uh, I will continue to work on this project. So this project is one of the things we've done is we've, we've actually uh, started the, the process of twinning Highway 3 between Tabor and Burdette. That was all about being able to help uh, make sure we can go out further to be able to get those specialty crops to market. Um, we're adding 230,000 irrigated acres onto, um, into this area. Now remember, we already have 70% of Canada's irrigation land right here, but we're gonna add an extra 230,000 irrigated acres. It's the largest expansion in irrigation land uh, ever in Alberta's history. And so we are excited about doing that. We think that this is going to really matter to our children and grandchildren. I'm excited about being able to get it done. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hunter. Mr. Hinman, please. Well, good evening. It's great to be here and welcome other candidates. It's, I appreciate you stepping forward as well. But I think the most important thing when it comes to a democracy is people to have choice. And it seems like that choice has been stripped away from us in many aspects. And I've been, uh, I guess, want to say, pull, pulled back into the fight be because of what's happened over the last few years. And th the reason why I got into politics, I guess, in the first place was because of my grandfather. He used to be the provincial treasurer for the social credit back in the 60s. And I was growing up on the farm. He was always talking and, and giving me books and saying, you need to read this on the economy. You need to read this on good government. You need to understand these areas and aspects of health care. And I, I didn't realize at the time that not everybody received that because whatever we grow up in, we just think that that's normal. Everybody talks about politics and about the economy and the importance of good government. And as I got older, I realized that that wasn't the case. That it was actually 50 years ago this, this fall that I went to my first uh, social credit uh, AGM, got involved and got on the youth committee and everything else. But over those 50 years, I've, I've growing a real passion for what is good government. And if you look at other aspects of, of our lives and you go back 50 years, 100 years, 200 years, you realize how much the world has changed and how it's evolved and gone forward. But yet, if you look at politics, we're still stuck in the same old system with the same old uh, 
policies that, that aren't allowing us to be innovative and in going forward. And, and I want to say, when I talk about being innovative, it, it's really about being accountable. I think one of the biggest problems, and again, as Wild Rosers, we've brought this forward three times to the legislature, is that government isn't going to change until they're actually accountable to the people. We get elected representatives, and immediately they represent the premier and, and not the area, and they're not allowed to speak out. And COVID uh, really uh, amplified that in the silence of the elected MLAs. Um, I remember sending them all an email in December uh, when we were told that we were going to be locked down. And I said, you know, you, you 17 rural MLAs who say that you're speaking out, all you need to do is walk across and sit as independents and, and have a voice and say no to this. And, and they wouldn't do it. And it frustrated me and many others. And so that kind of started pulling me back into the politics because what, what it's really about in the U.S., it's about our Constitution and whether or not we recognize the supremacy of God and the rule of law. And when that's trashed on, um, we know where that goes. We just need to look around the world and, and realize the, the inequities of different individuals and whether or not they have inalienable rights. I always give the example of the Dominican Republic and Haiti. Here's a small little island in the Caribbean that basically has the same resources, same historical people, but there's a line drawn down the middle of it. And on one side, you have uh, the tyranny of, of a dictator. On the other side, a little bit more, uh, I want to say, free market and, and democracy. And you look at the difference. And again, as we look around the world right now, we, we see that. We, we see the authoritarians that are pushing in on, on, our, on our freedoms and saying what we can and can't do. Um, I, I couldn't believe the decisions that were being made on what was essential services and what was not essential services. Whether or not you could go to church, whether or not you could go to a funeral. Well, those are all constitutional rights that I believe were trashed on and we need to come up with a new system. We need to have accountability where we could go out and sign petitions and fire our elected representatives and say, you know, this isn't what we signed on for. But I think this is the most important election in our lifetime. Um, the reason why I say that is because we have a prime minister and a, a federal government that wants to shut down our oil and gas industry. They want our farmers to reduce fertilizer by 30%, and they want to shut down our beef industry. And for me, none of those things are acceptable. But the real problem is that we have two other individuals in the NDP and the UCP that agree with that. The only thing they disagree on is how fast we should do this. And the, the truth is, is that the federal government wants to shut down Alberta, and we have two individuals that are seeking to, to run this province that say, well, one says it should by 2035, and the other one says by 2050. And that's not acceptable. To me, what this election is really about is whether or not we're going to be part of the Paris Accord and carbon net zero, or whether we're going to wake up and say here in rural Alberta where fertilizer is so critical, oil and gas is so critical, to have a voice to say no. And it starts here in Tabor Warner where we can say no to carbon net zero. And if you can't fire them, don't hire them. Thank you. Thank you to all of our candidates for those opening remarks. I did uh, neglect to mention one thing off the top. I wanted to thank the, the Chamber, the Tabor Chamber of Commerce. They are the ones that are hosting and putting this on tonight. Ann Jensen is here in the room somewhere. She's done a lot of work to do that, as well as Rick getting that going. So if we can give them maybe a round of applause to the Chamber, please. <laughs> thank you, and sorry again for neglecting to say that off the top. Also, I do, did want to mention, as you see, there are some cameras here that this forum is being broadcast live on the Chamber Facebook page as well as the Chamber YouTube channel. And a, uh, a saved copy of this forum will also be available on the Chamber YouTube uh, channel after it is completed and will stay there for some time. Okay, we will move on now to uh, the first of our two questions that were originally submitted and sent to our candidates to prepare for. We will answer, answer these in the following order, please, Mr. Hunter, Mr. Hinman, and then Mr. Ginther. So the question is, there has been a lot of discussion through the campaign already about health care. What are your thoughts on the future of health care in Alberta? And then there is sort of a B follow-up side to that question that we'll have you address. And it is, what can be done to assist in the shortage of doctors in certain areas, especially in southern Alberta? 
So again, there's been a lot of discussion through the campaign already about health care. What are your thoughts on the future health care in Alberta? And what can be done to assist in the shortage of doctors in certain areas, especially in southern Alberta? And again, just a reminder, three minutes for each answer. Uh, green on two minutes, yellow on 2.30, and red on three minutes. Mr. Hunter, please. Thank you, Ken. And um, it's a very important question. I think it's probably the top, at least top two issues uh, that I hear at the doors. You know, good health care is not waiting on a wait list for um, a hip replacement or for a knee replacement. Uh, good health care is timely health care. And uh, one of the things that uh, I was really impressed with uh, Premier Smith uh, that she did is she said, you know what, we're not going to have any more excuses about these timelines. And so she actually fired the Alberta Health Services Board, which I thought was a pretty bold move. She brought in um, Dr. Cowell to act as the administrator. Dr. Cowell has a, a, an interesting skill set. He's like a change management person. He sees things differently than most bureaucrats see it. And when he, when he came in, he says, you know what? We need to make sure that we're utilizing our uh, operating rooms properly. And so um, he worked at making sure that those operating rooms that were in different parts of the province were being utilized. Uh, he also actually made sure that we implemented um, chartered surgical facilities, which are working very well in other uh, jurisdictions around the world. And these chartered sur surgical facilities are owned by surgeons, uh, but it's a publicly funded uh, service. Because of that, we've actually been able to see a decrease in surgical wait times by 3,000 people per month. That means that within about five months, we'll be able to reduce that wait list, that, that the, the number of people on that wait list down to zero. And we can be back on where we should be, which is the medically uh, acceptable wait times. That hasn't happened in a long time. I, I would have to say many years back, and it was a very bold move. Um, and I remember when we did it, the NDP were not happy about that. And they kept on saying things like we're privatizing healthcare, which is not true. This is owned by surgeons, and every time you go out to a doctor's uh, uh, facility, um, this is also owned by uh, doctors as well. And so it's the same system, um, and they applied it. And now we're seeing the great outcomes because of it. So that's the one thing that Dr. Cowell and uh, Premier Smith was able to do. The second thing that they were able to do is decrease the red alerts uh, in, with EMS. So rather than e uh, ambulances being stuck in, uh, you know, 20 deep at, at uh, emergency rooms, um, they're able to get them in and out back into their areas really quickly. And I think that's really what's important. And they've done it. We have great outcomes because of it. Thank you. Mr. Newman, please. Well, it really is an important issue, and it's the biggest expense here in the province. And I'm going to say there's two, two critical things that we need to do. One is funding following the service, and the other one, um, well, let, let's just talk a bit about funding following the service. That Currently, right now, we have what we call global funding. And so a hospital uh, gets its money because how many beds it has, what doctors it has, what operations it performs, and it's given that. And then the administrator divvies that all up over the year and how we're going to do it and so we can have so many, you know, uh, uh, hip operations, so many of this, and, and they're all allocated out. If we actually switched and switched so that the funding followed the service, we'd have facilities that actually the administrators say we need to, we, we can increase here, we can bring in a doctor. And that, that's the other big change is that we need to get rid of central decision making. As an MLA, I was shocked at the decision making on Edmonton saying what Calgary could have, what Calgary saying what rural Alberta could have. Here in Tabor, you know, Dr. Torrey's brought in some special equipment that we can uh, get access to much quicker here than other areas. But if you actually have the CEO in charge of his hospital, knowing what's needed, and again, the respiratory therapists and the work they're doing here um, on those with allergies and stuff is, is leading. 
that the funding doesn't follow the service, and so they try to work it in there. So we need to get rid of the central decision making. We need to have chief office administrators that are saying, you know what, we could actually bring in a surgeon here that wants to do hip and knees. We have the facility. There's lots of facilities that still aren't being utilized fully, and it's great, and I, I hope that in five months it's gonna be solved. I don't believe it is, but I, I sure hope you're right on that, Grant. I haven't heard quite such resounding results, but we've gotta change that, and again, for getting rural doctors to come out, we need to allow them to, to have full access and full privileges on what they want to do and what they want to practice. Again, right now, the control comes from central Alberta. They say what they can and they can't do, and whether it's Milk River, shutting down different um, things that they can do there, whereas if they were actually the funding following the service, there'd be doctors that would move there that would want to perform those operations. And again, when it comes to the, uh, emergencies and the EMRs, it, we need to have an absolute change. When you show up at the emergency room, they need to respond to you, and it's the same with an EMR. It's just unacceptable to have EMR ambulances sitting there waiting for people to be brought into the hospital. Uh, it, it just doesn't happen, and it needs to change, and again, we can do that from the top down on that, but thank you. Thank you. Mr. Gendry, please. Despite the governing party patting themselves on the back, a lot of the damage is already done. They've fired hundreds of healthcare workers because they wouldn't take their COVID vaccine. There's a 69,000 patient surgery backlog, and if you're one of those people, you don't care about these improvements, you want your surgery. Uh, one of the ways I think that we could address that is actually more privatization, and I know that's not something everybody likes to hear, but if you look at something like uh, LASIK eye surgery, for example, it used to cost $20,000 $20,000 per eye for that surgery, and because more doctors started offering it, it became more common, more streamlined. It, the cost is down to $2,000 an eye, which is something that a middle-class family can uh, actually afford. Uh, just today, Milk River has closed a dozen more beds or so, so I don't think that the problem is getting better. I think it's getting worse, um, and one of the things that I think we could promote is health uh, promotion, personal health promotion to prevent some of these problems from arising in the first place. But we need to allow some privatization so can we uh, have more doctors move to southern Alberta in an effort to try and reduce the backlog created by the government's COVID policy. Okay, thank you, Mr. Ginther. As we know, um, with these questions, there is uh, allowed a follow-up. If anyone would like to take that follow-up, you would have two minutes now. Mr. Hunter, go ahead. So I just wanted to also address the issue of the shortage of doctors in rural Alberta. One of the best ways to be able to keep doctors in rural Alberta is to have them come from rural Alberta. And so we actually, a couple of years ago, we set up a, a, a new stream, uh, revenue stream, uh, to, or sorry, a new stream uh, to be able to pay for people coming from rural Alberta. So we have $10 million in this kitty that allows um, people from rural Alberta to go and get trained to become doctors. And we know that if they, because they have families in rural Alberta, they'll go back to rural Alberta and they would like to serve in rural Alberta. That's the best way to be able to uh, approach that and to fix that. Uh, the problem is, is that it takes a long time to be able to, uh, to train doctors. And so this is something that was kind of a long-term strategy, but it's probably one of the best strategies in terms of long-term fixing this problem. One of the things we did out in um, Milk River is we recognized that Milk River, when you have a doctor out there, they were coming from other countries, they would come there. They didn't have, uh, they didn't stay because they just couldn't see enough people out there. So a fee-for-service uh, just didn't work. That model didn't work out there. So what we've done is we've moved it to an, an APR, which is the, the same kind of service that is done in Tabor here. That way doctors can stay out there, they can get the work done that they need to, they, they can see five people or, or 50 people, it doesn't matter, they'll still get paid the same amount, they're on a, on a wage. And uh, we have two doctors that are going to be hired out there. We're going to have a nurse practitioner. We're going to have a, a physician assistant. I think it's going to be able to fix that whole problem that we've had out there for so long. Anyone else with a follow? Oh, go ahead. So I'd just like to comment on that. I, I, again, it goes back to hospital administrators. There's lots of things that, that Milk River and even Tabor wanted to offer, but central government says, no, we're not going to allow that. And we need to allow doctors that want to move there um, and do that. I, I remember back in 2004 when we were fighting to get the MRI here in Lethbridge, and I, I couldn't believe the arrogance of, of the 
I, I want to say the health board and whatnot, and he says, Paul, what you don't understand is a doctor that's got that amount of education doesn't want to be in Lethbridge. They want to be in Calgary or the city. And, and they're, they're, they're so full of themselves on making those decisions. And this is what's wrong with central government, making the decisions, telling you what you can and you can't do. Uh, there was a doctor that, that, that grew up in Lethbridge. He was down working in the States, and he wanted to come back, but he wanted to come back to Lethbridge. We raised the money there to, to get the facility, the equipment, so he would come back. And so I'm going to say what's most critical is allowing the, the, the funding to follow the service. And then a doctor will come and want to say we want to be there. We've had... Um, doctors that want to do all kinds of operations in Lethbridge and again central government says nope we're not going to allow it uh, when I was at MLA 50% of our heart patients never made it to Calgary in time to get treated and they wouldn't allow for an arthros ar arthropedic arthroscopic doctor to come in and work here um, it, it's just wrong and central government central decision and, and that global funding needs to change and, and it will with a Wild Rose Loyalty Coalition government Mr. Ginther, anything in response? You can if you'd like. I would just like to add that uh, the doctor who was in Milk River didn't leave because he wasn't seeing enough patients. He left because they threatened to take his license away when he prescribed ivermectin. And one of the major problems that we also have in Alberta healthcare is that so much money gets wasted on management instead of frontline LPNs and healthcare aides. Okay, thank you, everyone. Um, Matt, I just did receive a text. I don't know if you can change it from a couple people watching online that it sounded quite quiet. Um, I don't know if you can turn the volume up to the online side or not, um, but just that feedback. Okay, thank you everyone. We'll move on to the second question that was submitted to our candidates. And uh, as this is put on by the chamber, um, we did want to be able to have some questions that were specific to businesses as the chamber definitely represents uh, um, us as business owners and businesses here in Tabor and in the area. So this is deemed a little bit more towards that. So the question is, in your opinion, what should and can be done for business in this area, specifically around the rising costs, labor shortages, and increase in taxes? So in your opinion, what should and can be done for businesses in this area, specifically around rising costs, labor shortages, and taxes? Mr. Hinman, if you can go please um, first and then Mr. Ginther, and then Mr. Hunter. Thank you. Well, one of, the, one of the, our, our platforms is, is that we need to reform the tax system. Currently, we send about $65 billion a year to Ottawa, and then we put our hand out asking for health care transfers, uh, policing, infrastructure, and, and it's wrong. What we really need to do, and again, at the last municipal election, we had this... Uh, uh, <laughs> can't, we, we, we had this opportunity to vote on whether or not we wanted to end equalization. But the question should have been on that referendum, should have been a referendum on saying that we're going to collect all the taxes here in Alberta by Albertans for Albertans. There's currently 42,000 plus people that work for the CRA. We don't have very many that work here in Alberta. They should be here. They should be Albertans that are receiving that. But most important, we need to be collecting the money here because when we send it down there, we know that it goes for all kinds of ridiculous vote buying schemes out east. And it's wrong. The latest one, $13 billion to Volkswagen for a battery factory. That isn't what we need. This isn't where we want our money to go. And so if we were to actually have a referendum by the people and get a mandate to collect the taxes here, and again, we're going to have, uh, I think, government say, oh, oh, that's breaking the Constitution. This Constitution is broken all the time by the federal government. If you don't step forward, get our own bank account, start looking after the money, um, we're going to be sucked dry, and we have to change that. Uh, again, all taxes should be eliminated on energy, on, on such a core input. Everything from fertilizer, for heating, for traveling, all of that. Alberta should have the advantage of cheap energy, and we don't. Uh, it, it's taxed uh, and regulated to the point where you and I uh, have to pay a premium price for that. And so if we were to eliminate that, it would be great. If we were to actually, um, again, stop sending so much money to Ottawa and collecting it here and only sending the money that's, that's their constitutional responsibility. Example, the military, 21 plus billion dollars uh, spent on the military. We're 10% of the country. Yes, we'll send down the 2.1 billion dollars because it's their federal responsibility. Uh, another issue that we have, I'm going to run out of time here on taxes, but we, we have a lot of civil servants and we have uh, uh, teachers, we have doctors, we have nurses, we have senior caregivers, all of these people, and they're paid from Alberta taxpayers. We collect that money and then we pay them. 
And if we are collecting all the taxes here, we could keep their, their taxes. But instead, we've paid our taxes as Albertans, then we pay the teachers and all of the civil servants, and then they pay it again twice to Ottawa. We, we need to uh, stop sending our money from Alberta uh, Public Service down to Ottawa and say, no, you're not going to double tax us. But there's a lot of things, but not enough time. Thank you. Mr. Ginther, please. Uh, I think we need to simplify the tax code. I don't think business and corporate tax should ever go over 10%. And I definitely don't think that uh, the government is the solution to business problems. Uh, the one thing that they should definitely never do is decide which businesses can stay open and which have to close, which customers can go in and which ones have to stay home. How many mom and pop shops went bust during COVID while the big box stores got to stay open? And I don't think that that was right. I actually think that that was illegal. And the Solidarity Movement stands firmly against policies like that. Mr. Hunter? So I had the privilege of being able to set up the Red Tape Production Ministry and uh, be the first Red Tape Production Minister in Alberta. Uh, we set out to be able to quantify how many hoops that businesses and regular Albertans have to jump through. It was a massive uh, undertaking, uh, but we found out that there was over 670,000 hoops that uh, businesses and Albertans have to jump through. And our goal was to be able to reduce up to 33% uh, of those, those regulatory hoops. And we, we did. We've, by the end of this year, we will be at 33%, a net 33% reduction. I put that in perspective when the, uh, when the uh, Canadian Federation of Independent Business puts out their report card for red tape reduction, uh, Alberta was always getting an F. And uh, we are now at an A. Uh, we get an A from Alberta Federation of uh, uh, Independent Business every year now. And uh, it was actually a privilege. I actually received the uh, red tape reduction uh, award uh, for the work that we did. I told the Premier he should get it, but he said, no, I think you should get a grant. I think the best thing you can do is get out of the way of our job creators and innovators. That's probably the best thing we can do. And, um, and so it put a smile on my face every day when I got to go to work and find those ways of being able to get government out of the way of our job creators and innovators. Um, I was privileged to do that over uh, two and a half years. Um, the, the other thing that I think needs to be stated is, is that um, just recently we announced that we would be reducing the business tax uh, down to 8 per, or sorry, not the business tax, but the income tax down to 8%. People can be able to keep more money in their pockets. Uh, anybody that makes $60,000 or less, they, they will benefit uh, by a 20% reduction in that, in that uh, income tax cost. The other thing is that everybody is actually going to benefit about $750. So if you've got two people working in your family, you've got a $1,500 uh, benefit there. The nice thing about that is, is that now you have more money in your pocket to be able to go out and spend. That's going to benefit the, the businesses in your area, more uh, disposable income. I think these are the types of things that governments can do uh, effectively to be able to actually build areas and um, uh, build up communities. Thank you. Okay, we will move forward. These next two questions, uh, just out of uh, note, is uh, the candidates will be hearing them for the first time. Um, the first two were submitted to them uh, with about uh, a 36 hours notice. These ones they will be hearing for the first time and are ones that we received uh, directly to the chamber. So thanks for those that submitted these questions. Okay, question, uh, the first question in this category is this. With the cost of inflation, many people are finding it difficult to feed their families and are turning to food banks. According to, the, according to their CRA charity information, Safe Havens Women Shelter received close to 1.2 million in government funding in their last reporting period to help victims of domestic violence. The Tabor Food Bank received around 23,000 for their last reported period. This seems like a large difference to help meet an essential, an essential need. Are you and your party committed to helping food banks receive increased funding to help feed those who are struggling? So again, the uh, women's shelter, Safe Haven Women's Shelter, which is here in Tabor, um, received, according to the CRA charity information, 1.2 million, and the Tabor Food Bank, around 23,000 in the last reported period. Are you and your party committed to helping food banks 
receive increased funding to help feed those who are struggling. Um, I think we are on Mr. Ginther first, please. Well, I think there's lots of money to go around to help food banks, but I don't think that that's uh, a long-term solution at all. Uh, people shouldn't be having to go to the food bank, for one. And for two, what happened to the church? Uh, my party is led by Arthur Pulowski, who spends a vast majority of his time running around feeding the homeless in Calgary. And, I mean, the, you can watch the rates of people who attend church go in the toilet. Look at the effect that that's had on our society. So uh, while I think that there is room for more money for food banks, I don't think that's a solution that the government should put all its eggs in. I think that's a more of a culture solution and if anything the government could put money back in people's pockets so that they don't wind up in the food bank in the first place. Mr. Hunter please. Um, so during well because of inflation which was not caused by Alberta or um, by us it was caused it's a worldwide event. Inflation was actually caused because of supply chain issues um, that happened through COVID and because $5.2 trillion was added to the economy, and so this is going to drive up um, the price of everything. So we didn't cause the problem, but we were in an enviable position to be able to help Albertans. I mean, I think everybody here probably remembers back in Ralph Klein's time when we got the Ralph Bucks. And I remember the, some people were saying, oh, that's terrible, you shouldn't be giving Ralph Bucks out. But I remember, I loved it, I was so happy to get Ralph Bucks. So when I talk to people at the doors, they tell me, you know, so what, we, what we've done is we've been able to give $2.2 billion for our affordability measures to be able to help people through this difficult time. That is, a, so individuals who have children or people who are on fixed incomes like senior citizens are able to get $100 over six months. Um, and that has been helpful. People have said to me, you know what, we really appreciate that little hand up. And... Uh, the nice thing about it is we didn't have to go into debt to do it because we were careful with our money. We were careful with our budgeting. I, was, I sat on Treasury Board for three and a half years. Those were not easy uh, decisions that we had to make, but we were careful with our money. And because of that, and because the price of oil did go up, there was a few other things also that happened. Um, we were able to be able to provide that help, that hand up to Albertans without having to add debt. And a lot of provinces that are actually doing these affordability measures are actually adding debt uh, to their children and grandchildren. Uh, we didn't have to do that. So um, in terms of the food bank specifically, though, uh, we were able to actually use some of the affordability measures to be able to provide some help to the food banks. Food banks, by the way, normally don't get money from the government. They actually use it. Uh, they get money through uh, communities and, and through donations. And they like it that way, by the way. Mr. Himnan, please. I think the, the most important thing to realize is that government needs to reduce its size and scope of office. And I, I agree with Mr. Gunther here that re really that, that char charity doesn't come from the government. And when we get this idea that we need to depend on the government, we the people become lazy and slothful and think, well, no, that's government's job. It actually comes from the people. I, I remember uh, getting a statistic back in 2005 showing the, do the charitable donations from people in our different communities. And they, they need to be given credit for that. But more important is that we need to increase the a actual credit that you get on your tax returns for giving to charity. And this idea to tax us more so they can give away more uh, is, is unacceptable to me. The government's job should be looking at every opportunity to reduce taxes. If we can go down to 8%, can we go to 6%? You know, we should be always rolling back our taxes, not upping our, our, our charitable donations or helping those in need. Uh, we, we absolutely need to eliminate the tax on fuel, on, on energy, on hydrocarbons. It's just wrong, it's punitive, and it causes inflation. It's probably one of the biggest inflation things outside of the monetary easement that the money that they printed and the debt is the fact that we have to pay $65 a ton onto all, all of the hydrocarbons, fertilizer. All of these things are impacted, and we need to say no to this. It's unacceptable to have those taxes. We need to eliminate taxes on the food. It's just wrong. I believe if we collected all the taxes, we'd be able to. If we collected all the taxes here in Alberta for Albertans, we could actually eliminate property taxes. It's another thing. How can we say that we own our property when if we don't pay our taxes every year, um, they can confiscate it from us. They can put it up for sale. 
it, it's just wrong that municipal governments, which provide us most of our services, have to resort to property taxes in order to get that when there's billions of dollars. Uh, back in 2005, I have a report, and I call it the $21 billion fiscal imbalance. That's how much money Albertan sent to the federal government back then, and we didn't get enough back. We need to change the tax structure, um, and if we do that, we'll have more than enough money to look after our people, but more important, people will get the revenue they need, and the food prices and energy will be enough that they don't need to go to the food bank, because that's the real solution, is how do we get people back on their feet? Okay, thank you again to all our candidates for those answers. Our next question, um, again, that was submitted uh, through our social media channels is very simple and short. It is simply this. What are your views in introducing the fresh food tax credit? What are your views in introducing the fresh food tax credit? Mr. Hunter, first, please. Um, are you talking about what we've, what we've done? The question is specifically is um, what you will commit to or what your views are into, into introducing the fresh food tax credit. Well. That's how it's written. Okay. Um, so I'm not sure what that means, but what we've done is we've actually introduced a tax credit for um, agri-food processors that come in here. Anything over $10 million, if they're going to invest here, they get a 12% uh, uh, tax credit for that work and it's allowing them to be able to actually get into this area and be competitive with other jurisdictions so I'm not sure if that was what their question was but um, yeah I can only read what's written so and, and what they submitted so okay, okay thank you Mr. Hemden please I also have not heard of the fresh food tax credit, um, and that's a new one, but as I say, that we should, in our, in our brochure, it talks, we should eliminate all taxes on food. That's the transportation, the growing. Uh, how many years ago did we see all of the greenhouses in Medicine Hat? There should be greenhouses all across this province, but what's the policy? Oh, they, they, they want to have so many rules and regulations that people in rural Alberta, though a well might be producing gas, but it's not commercially viable, they got to cap it. Again, all these orphan wells, there's a reason why a lot of them were left open is because there's still oil and gas down there but it's just not economically at the time but if we quit taxing it and actually had that if you had it on your land it's not economically viable uh, I mean if gas is coming up uh, can compress it and you can use it we can have it in greenhouses we can have it all over but we, we should be absolutely flourishing with greenhouses across this province providing fresh food year-round but because of the taxes and the regulations and everything else it hasn't gone forward and again need to eliminate the taxes on energy and eliminate the taxes on food that we can actually have an abundance and then that drives down the prices. Mr. Ginther, please. I'm also not familiar with the tax credit and I'm kind of surprised that that's uh, somebody's number one issue is the fresh food tax credit. But yeah, you should be eating uh, fresh food. The food that's full of high fructose corn syrup is contributing to our health care crisis and our staggering obesity rates. Uh, I don't think that the government should be in the business of deciding tax breaks based on your diet, but I would encourage you to eat fresh food and food that's grown locally and grow it yourselves. Okay, thank you again. And, and sorry if there's vagueness to those questions. Again, we, we wanted to uh, bring them to you as they were written and not trying to make any assumptions to what should be added to those. Okay, so we would uh, like to now move on to a, an open mic system for a while. And again, I'll just remind you of, uh, of those rules in regards to timing if you are coming up to the mic, but also some extra rules that I, I would like to uh, uh, just to mention. Um, first off, uh, we would ask for sure if you do choose to come up and ask a question that you state who your, what your name is. Um, again, because this is a chamber event, if you are from a business or tied or linked into a business in Tabor or in the area, that you also state that business that you are from, if you wish. Um, we ask that you ask your question clearly and concisely. Again, you will have one minute to ask that question. You will, just like the candidates have been, get a green light on 30 seconds, a yellow light on 45 seconds, and at one minute you will, your mic will go off and we'll ask you to, uh, to have your question finished. We also ask for you to be courteous in the things that you ask. We also ask that uh, there's no vulgarity, uh, no foul language, or anything like that. Um, hopefully I don't have to uh, state that, but 
uh, as it is the obvious, so we would ask you to use full courtesy and kindness when you come to the mic. Um, and so if you are interested, then we simply will form just a line right behind the mic here in the center of the row. So again, one minute time limit, and we'll give you that opportunity now. Uh, just as a follow-up to that, you can ask a candidate specifically a question, and if you do that, please state that, and they will be given the full three minutes to respond, and then we will also, if you ask someone specifically, um, give the other candidates two minutes to also add to that if they wish. If it is a general question, we will go in the same order we have been as we rotate through each of the three candidates for an equal three minutes. My name is Daniel. I live in Coaldale, work in Tabor here. Uh, my question is specifically for you, Grant. Your government was part of policies that crushed individual liberties at absolutely staggering rates. And I want to know, were you either for that or were you against that and just silent and felt like not helping anybody out? Or what was your policy regarding specifically your government's COVID policy, preventing people from going to where they wanted to, buying what they wanted to, and uh, shutting down businesses? Well... Daniel, I can tell you that um, it was very difficult to be able to make those decisions, but there was a uh, COVID policy committee that was set up to, be to determine what, who was, uh, what restrictions were on, who was doing that. Unfortunately, I never got to sit on that, but we, as a caucus, we had the opportunity of being able to give feedback. And unfortunately, what I saw, Daniel, is that um, certainly there was an argument for people who were losing their lives. Seniors were losing their lives. People died from COVID. But that, was, that seemed to be the only thing that uh, Premier Kenny at the time and that, that group were looking at. I didn't feel like they were looking at the other side, which is the people who had lost their businesses, the people who had actually had a, a child that had tried to commit suicide because they were so depressed or someone who had been who had you know been fired because they didn't want to get the shot. Um, I tried to be able to present that side of the coin so that they would hear both sides. They made the decision about you know who was going to be restricted. Those I have to say a lot of the decisions that were made, they didn't seem like common sense. You know who gets to stay open, and which businesses uh, have to shut down. It did not make sense to me. And so your question to me is is did I, did I agree with them? There's lots of the stuff that they did that I did not agree with and that I actually presented very strong arguments against. And there were many of us in caucus that did, but the reality is, is that you are part of a big group of uh, caucus members. There were 63 of us. And at the end of the day, um, those decisions were made by, by people in this, this committee. Um, and again, it, it, it did feel like during that time, we were darned if you do and darned if you don't. Some people who actually I was actually working with, trying to help in my writings, sometimes they would say, well, Grant, I need to hear from you. I need to hear. Actually, I didn't believe in airing my dirty laundry in public. That's something, if you have a fight in your family, you don't go out in social media and tell everybody about it. You work it out in your family. And so that was a principle that I actually tried to apply. Daniel, just hang on. Before you ask a follow-up, I'm just going to give the other candidates a chance for your first question first, if they, if they wish. What order are we in? Um, we are, this was a specific question, so um, we'll go with you, Mr. Himner, first, if you wish okay. to, Th thank, to Thank you. Two I, minutes, and I, then Mr. Ginter, if you want. I actually wrote letters to them in December when Premier Kenny flipped from December 11th saying that, oh, we're, I've learned my lesson, we're not going to do any more lockdowns and uh, not one of the 63 MLAs responded back to me. But I told them that if you really cared about the people, if you really cared about the Constitution, all you need to do is say that we can't be part of this and they could go sit as independents. Not one of them would do it. It was later that Todd Lowen got booted out, but I think he was just criticizing the Premier. But th this is a problem and why we need recall. That when there's nothing that we can do but, but sit there and take the whipping from government, but how many of us would have been out there collecting signatures and firing our, our MLAs if we were allowed to do that? But again, uh, 
Premier Kenny promised recall. They've passed a, a recall bill now that's a joke. Um, and again, if we have another shutdown, the first 18 months that they're, if they form government again, there's nothing that we can do about that. That's unacceptable. If we want people that are representing us and not as, as Grant says that, oh, we're as a team decision. No, you, you don't go along with those team decisions in my opinion and I as your MLA will absolutely speak out against that. Our constitution is to protect our freedoms and it failed and there wasn't any elected people here in Alberta that spoke out and it was to the detriment of Albertans. Mr. Ginther, please, if you wish. I think an MLA's most important job is to put the interest of its constituents in front of his interest of his political career and his party. And as somebody who already left the party because they were doing things that were not in the interest of their membership or their constituency associations, I can assure you that that is not a stance or a position I would take. And for the UCP to act like they have no information about this or it was a big scary thing, well, there was countries like Sweden who didn't engage in any of this nonsense and they actually had better outcomes than we did. So this was a top-down policy implemented by Jason Kenney and carried out by his minions who just didn't have the backbone to do what was right and stand up for the people of this riding. Daniel, I'll give you an opportunity for one more que follow-up question if you have it. Uh, it's not a question. It's more or less... Uh if, uh, with your point on not airing your family's laundry, if my family is trying to forcibly hold me in my home and not let me go do what I wanted because of a decision I made, I would definitely air that laundry. Go ahead, Mr. Hunter, please. So, look, I, I can tell you, we, I, I agonized over this issue. I, I, I know that Paul sent me a letter. Many people sent me a letter. In, in rural Alberta, rural Alberta wanted to have less restrictions. The cities wanted to have more restrictions. That's, that is what happened. Unfortunately, there was far more MLAs in our caucus that were from the cities than there was from, from rural Alberta. And so at the beginning, if you remember, Premier Kenny actually did come out and he started out with a regional approach where he'd say, okay, well, if cities want to have more of the restrictions, that's fine, but if the uh, rural guys don't, then we'll, we'll have a regional approach. And then he changed. And I don't know why he changed. He never ever answered that question to me. Um, but that's what happened. Uh, and we had some, there was things that were done that just did not make a lot of sense. But remember guys, there were both sides to this coin. There were people who said, look, when you go out there and you don't wear a mask or when you go out there and you, you do certain things, you're causing my grandfather or my grandma to, to get sick and die. So I heard the same arguments. I heard the arguments from both sides. And now I landed on the side of, look, let's try to make sure that we have as much freedom and liberty as we can. And that was the argument that I brought forward to caucus as much as I could. Um, at the end of the day, uh, you know, I mean, this is little, con little uh, consolation, but at the end of the day, Alberta had the least amount of restrictions in all of the provinces. Um, and people say, well, you know what, we shouldn't have had any restrictions. Well, again, the, the arguments about having restrictions or not having restrictions were all argued within caucus. That is what happened within caucus. We had very, very strong arguments uh, that were made on both sides. Uh, but a decision had to be made. And, and, and you know what, people say that, the, the, uh, that it didn't work. Well, actually, it did work. Premier Kenny is no longer Premier Kenny. Danielle Smith is the premier now, and she's actually the one that actually is quite, quite forward about these issues. And so she's, you know, I think that the, the system has worked. And we do have recall. You know, Paul keeps on talking about that. We, ha we actually passed that. We passed recall in this, in this province. And citizens initiated referenda as well. Since there was a follow-up comment, we will allow follow-up uh, comments by our candidates. But just again, to remember this, uh, is a forum and not a debate. Go ahead, Mr. Hinman, please. Th thank you. Lieutenant Colonel David Redman, I don't know how many of you know him, but he was the uh, emergency manager of the province. We used to have an actual protocol what to do on this, and this idea that, that everybody has to be punished because somebody's grandparent or someone needs to be um, 
protected, that that's what you're actually supposed to do. Those people who need to be protected and the old emergency management thing, they would shut down the senior care facilities. They'd actually bring in volunteers and say, you know, will you come in and stay here for two weeks? But again, the, the debate was shut down. The mandate, the heavy hand was brought forward and, and that is not the role of government. The role of government is to say that this is the situation, this is the best information that we have. And as my colleague here mentioned, doctors who were looking at around the world and protocols to, to do things the College of Physicians and our chief medical officer uh, attacked them and slammed them down. There is no freedom to, to uh, negotiate this. And, and again, the arbitrary decision, I mean, how was it? 15 people could go to church, um, only five could go to a funeral? I, I mean, when you look at the, the reasons and the things they gave, it, it, it was just inexcusable the way they governed our province here, and the system didn't work quick enough, Grant. That's like saying, oh, someone's got their hip uh, replaced after two years. It was unacceptable, it was wrong, and Albertans went through a lot of pain, and a lot of families were divided because of that, because the government failed to protect our constitutional rights, and it needs to change, and it starts with accountability. And Grant, if you can't be recalled, or the Premier, for 18 months, and a lockdown comes down, that isn't recall. Recall is 24-7, so we need to change that. Mr. Ginther, if you wish, only. 51% of the UCP membership voted in favor of keeping Jason Kenney. So that should tell you everything you need to know about that party. Uh, I'm a veteran. I just about died in Afghanistan trying to defend other people's rights to have mine stripped away at home. Your liberties and your right to participate in society is non-negotiable. The reason that we have the Bill of Rights and our democratic freedoms is so that two wolves and a sheep can't decide what to have for supper. Okay, we will move forward if there's any other questions from the floor, if you could come forward now, please. What's my name? Hi, my name is Jordan. Um, I'm just wondering why disability support workers get paid so little. Is that a general question? Yep. Okay, yeah, if you could Why disability please. support service workers get paid so little? Disability support workers getting paid so little. Um, we on our rotation are on, let me find my questions here, I believe Mr. Hinman on a general question, if you could go please. Well, thank, thank you for that. Um, it, it, it's a real problem and there's a lot of workers and again with COVID, um, I, my, my wife sits on, on a board for the, one of the um, one of the boards for the disabled and, and it, it's a challenge. And I, I guess I'd have to say, you look back at government and, and, and say, you know, well, how, how valuable is this job? What can we afford to pay? And, and is it enough? And I, I would have to say that when it comes to those that are in the care of the disabled, it, it's a problem. And, and, and it shows because it's so hard to get workers in there. And I just think that the government needs to, to look at those situations and, and pay a proper wage to get things. But again, when I, when I say that, when you can't get workers in and the, uh, the perks, uh, the benefits aren't good enough, then normally what a business does, it increases the pay till it gets it or they shut it down. Well, we're not gonna shut down that, so we need to look at increasing the wage in order to attract the talent and the, the dedicated people that are there. But I also want to say that perhaps what we need to do is look at um, compensating and paying family members for looking after them as well. I, I think one of the problems in our society is this idea that, that seniors, uh, children, that, that they can't be cared for by their own family and the tax structure is such that, oh, if I take my child to someone I don't know that's accredited, that I can get a $7,000 tax credit. But if I take it to my, my, my sister or an aunt or my mother or, or someone else, oh, there's no tax credit. We, we need to change the tax system to where it actually benefits families first and they're not punished for it. And again, that, that goes through senior care, through um, child care, through the disabled, all of those. We, we've, we've pushed it out from the family and say it needs to be done here where in fact the family should be the first one and have the most credit and, and pay for looking after their loved ones because it, it's a true labor of love. Mr. Ginther, please. Well, I don't know a ton about the industry, but I would wager a guess that it's a lot like the healthcare profession where the management eats up a lot of the money that's allocated for it and the frontline workers are underappreciated. They're the ones in the trenches. They're the ones who are dealing with these people and they're the ones who work hard for very little in the middle class of our economy, the backbone of our communities, and look how they're treated. Mr. Hunter. 
So actually I have a question, is it unionized work or, or not? Okay. So um, when, you, when, when, the, uh, when a union goes through collective bargaining, they, they take all these things that, we, that Paul has just talked about into consideration. Um, you know, the level of, of education, um, how much experience they have, and that determines what they are paid. Um, I know one of my sons actually worked as, as a disability support worker. And uh, from what he told me, there seems to be a lot of uh, turnover within that because, of the, the, because it's so low. And I, I do think that um, at some point they're going to have to be paid more because you, you have to have some stability within that system. Because I know that a lot of times what will happen is you need to, lots of these people will be doing respite for, uh, for people who do this on a full-time basis like family members. And so it's important for the, even the mental health of uh, community or families to be able to make sure that these people are paid properly so that they have that service available. Um, but I, I don't know why they get paid so little. Uh, I just know that they do because, again, my, my son was, was a, a disability support worker. Thank you. I thank you very much, Brent, for your short, curt answers. I want to go to health care. I heard the other day in BC there's 2,400 nurses that did not take the shot, and they're out of work. There's doctors across the country. There's, there's people across the country that will come here to Alberta if we ask them, I'm sure. What would the UCP do? Are you looking at that avenue? Sorry, Brooks' husband from Tabor. And so this is a specific question for Mr. Hunter? Then? Yes. Okay. And I want to go on about private health care. Four years ago, I went to Germany for a back operation. Uh, if I hadn't had that back operation now, or then, I would have been toast. I would have been on drugs. I wouldn't have had a life. They gave me a mechanism that I can play hockey, I can do all my work, and I'm wondering how come this, this government doesn't bring in the Germans to teach them how to do this, these operations? Okay, so I think there's a two-part question there that'll maybe sum up. I think, first, sir, your first question was in regards to um, nurses, then there's nurses uh, out of province that could be brought in and what the UCP thinks about that or could do that. And then secondly, uh, secondly, as far as Germans or other countries coming and maybe teaching us about some of these techniques that you've experienced. Sorry, just recently we, uh, we made an announcement, the Premier made an announcement about being able to try to get those uh, workers to come in uh, and to incentivize them to come in. So actually the problem we're facing in Alberta is a labor shortage. So specifically in terms of healthcare specifically. Um, and so she's, she's actually announced that we, for people who come in, they stay, if they work for a certain amount of time, they're gonna get uh, X amount of dollars for the work that they do. Hopefully that will be able to bring them here rather than going to say BC or to Saskatchewan or to other provinces. Now, sorry, did you wanna say something? I'm specifically asking about Canadians, not out of, yeah. out of country. No, I am talking about people within the country as well. So we, have, we do have people that, that want to come here because they get paid more in Alberta than they get paid in other jurisdictions. That certainly helps. They come here because the cost of living is lower. Um, so there is, there is that Alberta advantage that actually brings people here. I know that the NDP have been saying that there's a whole bunch of healthcare workers that have left and that are leaving en masse. The statistics don't show that. We've actually had, we have more doctors than we've ever had. We have more nurses than we've ever had. But we're still actually, we, we still need to have more um, because of the influx of people that are coming here. We have, it's a good problem to have, but we have lots of people that are moving into this province, net migration in. To put that into perspective, uh, when the NDP were in for, four, for 13 consecutive quarters, people were leaving the province. It was the first time that we had actually seen that happen in Alberta in many years. 
Um, so people coming in, we need to have more doctors, more nurses, more hospitals, these things. Those, so we have to be able to, to uh, keep building that and keep on um, uh, hiring more people. Unfortunately, the whole world is, is in this, this, this problem right now of being able to make sure we have enough of these, these workers. I'll just let the other candidates uh, respond if they wish before you make any follow-up questions. Mr. Ginther, if you have anything, if you could go next. To your comment that there's a new documentary out called The Hidden Healthcare Crisis, which talks exactly about what you're uh, explaining with the BC health industry. And I would have to wonder, as a nurse from BC, why would you bother coming to Alberta? The UCP government's shown how they'll treat our healthcare workers. They fired our uh, nurses and doctors at the drop of a hat when they wouldn't do exactly what they were told, my wife being one of them. So I think it would be a lot to ask someone to put some faith into this conservative government, pack up your whole life just to have them turn it upside down another time. Mr. Hinman, if you wish. And I would echo, echo that, that the, the message that they've put out there is that you comply or you get ousted, whether it's a doctor, whether it's a nurse, and they need to retract that and say we were wrong. You know, of all the apologies and stuff that are going on, they haven't apologized about that yet. And the science is, is unequivocal that, that the vaccines did not stop the spread. All of the things that they were claiming that we needed to do it for this, we needed to do it for that. There's been no statistics on anything to show that any of that has worked. And as he mentioned, Sweden and other jurisdictions that didn't lock down, that herd immunity bumped up quicker. They never even recognized the nurses that wanted to say, just check me, I, I, I have the, the antigens in here. I've been exposed for 18 months. It was the same with the truckers. All of this, they refused to follow any of the science and it was all about compliance. And again, if they would apologize, but, but who's going to want to come here? Like you say, that, uh, that they're going to be trashed in no time. And it's, it costs money to move and get set up. And this government is not predictable on protecting human rights. Anything else? Or did you want to go to the second phase in regards to international medical? Yes, please. Okay. So again, just uh, our candidates, I think, again, directed at Mr. Hunter. Uh, the second question was in regards to um, this gentleman had uh, back surgery, I believe it was. Uh, done in Germany, what are we doing maybe to bring some of this expertise to Canada or to Alberta? Well, we have that expertise here. The problem is, is the wait list, the wait times are so long. And so to be able to, to, to decrease those wait times, like I said, Dr. Cowell has been tasked with being able to do that. Um, and those chartered surgical facilities that we've implemented now and being able to utilize more, more OR space is helping to be able to bring down those wait times. And in terms of, of um, specifically, like I know that I, I talked to a lady who uh, back in 2017, um, she was faced with a, a real, real dilemma. The NDP had brought in Bill 6, which basically was a compliance law for, for farms. Uh, for, for farm safety and it was going to cost them $120,000 to bring their farm up to compliance for what that bill uh, required and if she went down to uh, to Kalispell it would cost her $30,000 for a hip replacement. They weren't rich people they just decided that they were going to mortgage their house and go down and get the $30,000 hip replacement done. My question was well why did we have to wait so long here? It was 18 months that they would have to wait for that hip replacement you should not have to wait more than three months for that hip replacement. So bringing down those, those, uh, those hip replacement uh, surgery wait times is gonna help. Um, and I think that we're doing some pretty good work on that with Dr. Cowell and uh, the health minister. Mr. Hinman, if you want. Yes. This is the problem of centralized decision making. I, I remember a few years back that um, a lot of people are being treated with varicose veins, very troublesome problem, very um, expensive to go into the hospital to get them stripped and there's new technology out there to use a laser and, and again they, they would spend thousands of dollars to treat someone in the hospital and go there but the innovative doctors who wanted to bring that up here and charge seventeen hundred dollars they disallowed and it's the same the technology over in Germany Grant it, it isn't here you're the second person I know who's gone over there in the new technology but central government doesn't want that because it's going to cost them more money but if they paid for back surgery and, and you could uh, opt to say, well, I, I, I want this and let a doctor come here. And again, you have private clinics that are being funded through 
the healthcare system, it would change much faster than this idea of, of management and trying to do things. There's no innovation allowed with central government. And when new medical procedures come forward, if there's an open free market to provide the services, they'll get here a lot quicker and we'll get better service. And again, it's government funded. Um, say, okay, back surgery. And, and again, um, who, who is our cookie doctor that, that got fired and sent back to Australia? Can't believe I've forgotten his name. But he was getting paid $600,000 a year. And when he basically got let go because he said, I'm too busy, I, I can't answer meeting the cookie, what his, what his expertise was, was to actually figure out what it cost different hospitals to do different functions. And that's what we need. Actuaries that figure out what it costs, and if it's a back surgery, a hip surgery, say, look, we'll pay 30000 for this, or 60000 And then the innovators come in and, and have new technology instead of it being frozen with government saying, we're not going to bring that in. But it, the system is wrong, needs to be changed. Funding needs to follow the service and get rid of global funding. Mr. Ginther, anything? All I'll add to it is if you're one of the 69,000 people currently on the surgical wait list, none of this so-called progress means anything to you, as you well know. And the reason we're in this mess and the damage is done is because the UCP MLAs wouldn't stand up to Jason Kenney in the first place and tell him, no, we're not shutting our medical system down. We're not stopping surgeries. We're not going along with this program because look at the mess it's made. One last thing. I'd like to beg to differ with you as far as the golden standard of surgery in, in Alberta, as far as devices. Now, you may have them, but are they using them to the advantage? A young person with a back, a back issue, if he gets it fixed right away, he can be back in paying taxes again. I'm beyond that. So, thank you. Thank you, sir. Any other follow-up questions or any questions in general, please, from the floor? Hello, my name is Kirsten Ferguson and I'm a resident of Tabor. Um, and I'm just puzzling. I've been listening to the talk about reducing taxes, particularly by Mr. Hinman and Mr. Ginther. And I just wonder if you could help me to understand um, where that's going to be cut, cut from, so, because I'm just thinking of how many services I benefit from that are paid for by our taxes. The doctors, the nurses, teachers, police officers, and I happen to be a public servant, and I've worked in the same office for more than 33 years. And the level of financial scrutiny that happens on the front line right now is higher than I've ever seen it. Like, training, I bring my own pens to work <laughs> so I can write with pens that don't hurt my hand. So when I hear you say you're going to cut taxes, I get anxious about what that means. So can you tell me where is it you're going to get this? When you cut taxes, you have to cut services. So what is it that you're going to cut to make that? Is that a question for both the, the it's two for candidates? It's for the... It's an open question for okay. everyone, but particularly the two that say they're going to bring okay. our taxes down, because of course that sounds attractive. Okay, we'll make it a general question. Mr. Ginther, if you could go first, please. Uh, well, I also work in the public service. I'm a school teacher, and I know I bring my own pens and stuff to work too, but uh, I also know that there's tons of bureaucratic waste that goes on in every government department. There always has been, and there always will be, and that's where I would start, with management and trimming expenses down that way, putting more of that money into frontline staff, we need less administrators and more teachers. We need less uh, managers and more nurses. Mm -hmm. That sort of thing, I think, would go a long way to improving the public service and putting more money back into your pocket. Mr. Hunter. So we actually did do that. Uh, middle management was cut by about 7% uh, through attrition over the four-year period. Mr. Hinman? Excellent question, and again, it's not our frontline people that are the problem. It, it is the management and it's the, the way the system is set up. But our biggest problem here in Alberta is in the last 30 years, we've sent over $600 billion to Ottawa over and above what our services have come back. Uh, we, we're in a broken, dysfunctional, toxic relationship with Ottawa. And if you're going through a divorce and your partner is uh, having all kinds of problems with uh, spending money on drugs and everything else, you don't continue to send your money to your partner and ask for money to come back. 
We have to have a mandate from the people to collect all the taxes here. $65 billion goes out to Ottawa. Our, our entire budget here is just $65 billion. Ottawa is the biggest problem and the fact that we can't stand up. And that's why voting for someone like the Wild Rose sends a message to say that we need to change system. If you vote for the current legacy parties, it's status quo. Um, Ottawa gets to rule. The Supreme Court is against us. The, the federal government is against us. And again, the, the two wolves or the seven wolves get to uh, eat the lambs of the three sheep because our constitution allows for divisiveness. It's not good, but if we actually collected the taxes here and served Albertans first with it and not send it down to Ottawa where they spend billions of dollars and like I say the latest one 13 billion dollars for Volkswagen that's not government's job it's our taxes and we need to say no it should be municipal government first provincial and then federal but no we don't need to it's not the front line in the work that you and others are doing it's upper management and it's the excessive taxes and regulations from Ottawa Maybe one more question from the floor, if we could, please. It'll be our last question from the floor, if there is anyone. Steve sort of already asked what I was going to ask, but I'll just go on top. I'll add on to it. My name's Greg Price. Um, I'm a resident of Tabor. I mean, I think pretty much everyone would agree that I mean, you could almost have like a 0% business tax rate if we actually knew effective taxation that uh, the tax breaks would lead to research and development it would lead to family raising jobs and production and things like that but unfortunately what we're seeing a lot in the news it's dividends <laughs> for shareholders and things like that um, would you have any caveats to your tax breaks as far as in your businesses and things like that um, just for instance, I, I know there was instances of businesses that um, <clears throat> their quarterly profits did not budge an inch during COVID. Some businesses, some tanked and bankruptcy and things like that, who still took COVID money, even though... Uh, Greg, I'm going to get you just to, in time just to finalize Kay. your question, please. So I guess uh, my, my question would be just, would you have any caveats attached to any tax cuts? And is that a general question? Yeah. Okay. Mr. Hunter, first, please. I, I do believe that keeping the money in people's pockets, they know best how to spend it. So I 100% believe that. Um, but in terms of, of governments being involved in, in, in partnership with, with pri private sector, we've seen lots of ex experiences of that. In fact, down here, as I talked about earlier, 70% uh, of the irrigation, Canada's irrigation is right here. That was because of a partnership with government uh, to be able to build out these, you know, world-class irrigation systems that we have here. And we're, we're now in the process of doing something similar to that, partnering with uh, our irrigators and with the Canada Infrastructure Bank to be able to, to expand that irrigation that we have. Then we have more jobs, we have, so there is a trickle down effect that, that, that can happen. I think that's a good thing. I think that that actually can help build areas when it's done right. But we've also seen other situations where governments have given money to, uh, uh, you know, start something and then it tanks and then that's a loss of money. So I do think that it's important to make sure that you are, uh, are, are careful with what you actually do uh, partner with the private sector in when you're government. Mr. Chairman. Uh, again, an, an excellent question, and it, it, it boils down to reducing taxes. And if you get a robust economy that's going, a, a smaller percentage of a bigger amount is what we're really after. Premier Klein was, was uh, pillared for wanting to reduce the corporate tax from 15. He's going to go down to 8. I think he only got to 10. But if you looked at our, our corporate tax income, it doubled in the time that, that he, he did that. And so, and again, Walmart, you know, does the same thing. Is that, that they're rolling back the price. If they sell more, um, they can roll it back because the profit margins don't need to be there. But the key there really is a free market and open competitiveness. And we have way too many oligarchies that are going on um, that, the, that don't allow for that 
open competitiveness in the market and the rules, the regulations are, are such that people can't get in and compete because it's protected by the big businesses and the big corporations and even for such things as a mechanic to say that you got to put up a $50,000 bond in order to do these things. No, what we need is a judicial system that when somebody's done something wrong that there's an efficiency to go in and hold them accountable. This idea that more rules, more regulations is, is going to benefit society seldom works. I can't think of it as an example, but we actually had a judicial system where justice is served. Uh, most people can't access it. I just talked to a person yesterday that says, well, I, I need to go to court to do this, but when I was checked out the price, it was going to cost me more than to fight it so the person gets away. Um, but when it comes to taxes, absolutely, we need to look at reducing all of them. There's no area where I think that, oh, if we increase taxes here, it's going to be to the benefit. We, we want an open competitive market and an even playing field so a company can come in here and produce. And, and again, that abundance is what we're after. Mr. Kinther. I will just say that I have faith in the constituents of this riding to spend their money how they see fit. So the more of it you can keep in your pockets, the better. And same with the business owners. You've worked hard to make your business profitable and successful. And I think that you should reap the rewards of that and grow it even more and become an even more prosperous riding. Uh, I think any time that you give the government your money in hopes that they will spend it wiser than you is a fool's errand. Greg, did you have anything else at all? I'm, I mean, I guess clarifying the comment was it's more just ensuring that the, whatever tax is saved, I say it goes towards that job creation and goes towards increased wages or expansion, things like that, as opposed to just upper bloat, I guess you would describe it as. So, but Anything else with that clarification then? No? Okay. Thanks, Greg. Um, we are in interest of time. We are uh, getting close to 8.30. I know the, the event is set to 9 o'clock. We do want to be able to give some time for uh, some wrap-up from our candidates. So um, we do have two last questions maybe that we will, we will ask our candidates. Uh, both of them actually have come in from our viewers, which is great that we've also been able to uh, not only have you who have been here in attendance, and thank you for your attendance and, and being able to ask these questions, but also those that couldn't be here who have been watching live, I think it's great that we give them that opportunity as well. Um, and the first one is, uh, again, uh, both of them actually are uh, around things that we have already discussed, and, and I think um, several times, and because we have, I think they're very important on a lot of people's minds, and these are just sort of, uh, again, extending some of those, so I, I think we'll go to them, because again, I, obviously they're very important. Uh, and the first one, again, is staying with the theme which we really wanted to concentrate on, and that's through the Chamber, the businesses, and uh, it is, again, more specific to the labour shortage. We did touch on it briefly here and there, but this question is specific to um, with baby boomers retiring, and it's interesting that that question is there. I'm right on the edge of being a baby boomer, and the younger generation always calls me a boomer, no matter whenever I make some sort of wrong decision or comment about something, I'm a boomer because I'm old-fashioned, I guess. But um, So with baby, baby boomers retiring, how do we find the balance between bringing in foreign workers and wages to be competitive to attract the talent and yet, and yet not allowing our businesses here in Tabor and in the area to break the ba bank in doing so. So I believe we are on, back to Mr. Hinman first, please. You want that repeated at all? Please. Because I kind of <laughs> got personal in between there with my boomer comment. With baby boomers retiring, how do we find a balance between foreign workers and bringing them in and wages to attract the talent to allow our small businesses here in Tabor to survive? Well, I, I, I want to go back to start with just the overall taxes and regulations that our businesses have. And, and again, even the idea that we want to have a, a, a wage freeze or a wage increase. When, when government steps into the market, it, it, it always upsets the market. Um, Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations kind of coined the term that the invisible hand. And the invisible hand, um, by, by, I want to say by the socialist side, they say, oh, it, it's just too painful. But it's actually the heavy hand of government when it steps in to interfere and say, oh, we're, we're going to, you know, 
subsidize this industry here or we're going to give money there and it starts to upset and, and pull and push whereas the invisible hand is, is smoother but when it comes to businesses uh, back when I was younger what, what businesses could actually do if they advertised and couldn't find a worker they, they could have immigrants come and sponsor them and I think the biggest thing that if we don't have the workers and there's a business um, I, I remember one individual that was running a welding shop, um, was here in Tabor, and his neighbor's cousin from Germany was over visiting, and he was a welder, but they weren't able to get them here because of the regulations and the immigration policy. It's another thing that we should be taking into account here, but if, if we step back and allow um, businesses to sponsor individuals when they need them and family to sponsor individuals, I think we'll get to that balance a lot quicker than the government trying to uh, manipulate and, and get there. We need the, the demand to come from businesses and family, not government-driven picking and choosing because they're always behind and, and out of touch. The, the problem has to get pretty acute before government starts to respond, and then it's usually too late. Mr. Ginther? Uh, I think bringing in large pools of cheap labor only benefits big business and hurts small business, uh, local business, mom and pop business. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Century Initiative, but they want 100 million Canadians in Canada by the year 2100. What do you think that's going to do to wages? Uh, people will work jobs if you pay them to work them. I know maybe that's not what people who want to make maximum profits want to hear, but I'm a firm believer that the government should not be involved in deciding how many people are going to come here to work for what depressed wage. Mr. Hunter, please. Well, actually, I one thing that I talked to the Premier Smith about was actually bringing immigration in-house, so do it in, in Alberta. We have, there's a two-step process to being able to bring immigrants into Alberta to work. And I, like, look, if we do not have immigrants working in southern Alberta, we would come to a standstill here. That's the reality. Um, the Low River Mennonites have been absolutely critical to our farming operations here in southern Alberta. Um, Ottawa wouldn't understand that. Uh, they wouldn't really get that. They're too far removed from it. So I think we should actually bring immigration in-house. Quebec does it. They actually have the immigration as uh, something that they do in-house within Quebec. That way we're able to address the issue quicker uh, than, you know, as we see these trends need, needing people, we can actually address those, those issues quicker. Um, the other thing that I'll say is I actually agree with Paul in terms of, of letting markets determine the, 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 the price of labor. Um, it will be a lot faster and a lot better at it. And, and when we, I know when the NDP brought in a 50% increase in minimum wage from 1050 up to $15, they, they actually, the, what happened was a lot of those uh, minimum wage people lost their jobs. They, they lost their jobs because the businesses could not afford it anymore. Or, well actually, and those businesses actually also had to increase wages. So there was an inflationary measure that actually happened as well driving up price and then consumers that would come in, like at a restaurant, come in, you're gonna pay, uh, normally pay nine bucks or seven bucks for a, a hamburger, now you're paying 11, 13 dollars for a, a, a hamburger. That price shock actually made people say, you know what, I'm not gonna go out and buy that anymore. And so then the cost to your economy actually is even higher. And we gotta make sure that we don't do those types of policies. Markets can figure themselves out in terms of labor costs, but in terms of immigration, I really think we should bring it in-house. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for all of those. One last question. We'll turn to that question, and, um, and then we will uh, let our candidates uh, wrap up, and um, we'll end our evening. Um, so this, again, um, obviously is specific to the health care and, and a concern that this person still has, and uh, they feel that uh, it hasn't been uh, specifically answered in regards directly to the uh, doctor shortage. So the question is this. It's been discussed, particularly by Mr. Hunter, a long-term strategy for rural doctor shortage. What strategies, however, do we suggest or do you suggest to immediately curb the shortage of doctors in southern Alberta, particularly in the shortage of specialists in Lethbridge, such as the massive OBGYN shortage? Premier Smith suggests recently on a visit to Lethbridge that possible solutions could be to increase in home births or pregnant women driving to Calgary for care, which obviously is not feasible. What is the part of the plan going forward for the immediate 
shortage of specialists and doctors in this area which directly impacts the Tabor Warner area. I believe we're at Mr. Ginther first, please. Well, I would say a recruiting drive is absolutely necessary. We need some incentivization to bring these doctors here, whether that's privatization of certain medical aspects or other things. Uh, it, it doesn't really matter. If you're the person in need of the doctor, uh, the government obviously is going to ha that's one of the things they're responsible for providing you, and that's one of the things that they're going to have to take care of. So whatever your carrot you're going to have to dangle on the end of the stick, that's feasible to get people to come here, you have to start thinking of those options. And I think allowing doctors to engage in private practice to make some more money would be one of those things. Mr. Hunter, please. So again, I, I stated this earlier, but um, we actually have just announced, uh, uh, Premier Smith just announced that we would actually be giving incentives for healthcare professionals to come in and other workers as well. I think that's going to help. Um, that is that kind of that carrot that Brent was talking about. Um, but the other thing that we, we, we need to do is we need to make sure that credentialing is, is more seamless. When people come from other areas, uh, other countries, uh, there's, there's to, too many of these hoops they've got to jump through to be able to actually come and practice here. Even though they've been you know, trained in some of the best schools in the world, they've got to jump through those hoops. So we've got to make sure we get rid of those things. I think that's a red tape reduction issue. Uh, and I think that uh, Dr. Cowell is also working on that, uh, the administrator of Alberta Health Services. I'm, I'm going to say that funding following the service and allowing uh, hospital administrators to make some decisions would change. And, and again, whether you call it privatizing or whatever, that, that we have operating facilities that aren't being utilized. Uh, it, it just needs to change. But if a doctor wanted to come and set up in Tabor or, or Milk River because he knows that he can set up his practice and he's going to get paid for it, I think that would be the incentive that would actually bring them here. But when it's at, at the beck and call of, of the regional or the central health care, why, why would a doctor come here? But if he knew that he could come and work and work hard, uh, the, the, the backlog is here. Uh, I think that would be the biggest motive to, to bring them here is funding following the service and doctors would provide the service and would come here because they know they're going to get paid for it. Okay, thank you again. And again, in the interest of time, that uh, will be our last uh, specific question of the night. We would ask now each of our candidates to please take three minutes. Uh, you'll get the green light on two yellow light on two and a half, and red light on three minutes. If you could please take three minutes just to uh, wrap up the evening, anything that you would like to conclude on uh, or ask for support on. Uh, we will start. Our rotation is Mr. Hunter, please. Again, thank you for uh, a lively debate or forum on these issues. I think that they were very important. We talked about some good things. I want to tell you that, um, look, I, I am excited about the future for Alberta. I'm excited about the future for this area. Um, we've got some exciting things happening with this agri-food processing corridor. There's going to be great jobs, for op opportunities for our children and grandchildren in this area. We're going to have growth for the next 10 to 20 years. This is the kind of stuff that uh, only happens once in a generation. And uh, I was privileged to be able to actually sell that to, um, to Treasury Board, to the Premier, uh, and to our caucus to be able to actually get these, these, these funding announcements onto budgets. People can say a lot of things about a lot of stuff, but getting something done is not easy to do. And this is what I commit to you to do. I will, I will continue to be a team player, and you can, you can light your hair on fire in opposition. You can, you can say that you're going to do this or do that, but when you're in opposition, it is almost impossible to get anything done. Not in our Westminster parliamentary system. Let's just be clear about that. So I have, uh, for the last couple of years, working in uh, Treasury Board, working on Cabinet, and working in our caucus, I've been able to build those relationships of trust with other ministers, with other colleagues. And because of that, on day one, after May the 29th, I can start, hit, I can hit the ground running. We already have a plan to be able to build the area. That, I think, is what the, N, the, the uh, MLA should be doing. And that's what I commit to you to do, is to make sure that I hit the, the ground running, making sure that we build a strong economic um, powerhouse in southern Alberta here. I have a plan. Uh, I've presented it to you. And now we just need to be able to implement it. Thank you so much for the questions that you've asked. Um, and I thank you for being involved in politics. It's not an easy thing to do, but I appreciate uh, all that you've done. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Hunter. Mr. Hinman, please. Well, thanks for coming out. I think this is the most important election in our lifetime. And I, I just got to make one quick comment. If this uh, corridor is dependent on, on Grant Hunter and the, and the UCP being there, heaven help us. Uh, this is always the problem. Government makes all these claims, all these wonderful things that they're doing, when in fact is business. If the rules and the regulations are, are, are clear and they understand what they do, then businesses will come. And I think it's those rules and regulations. And yes, if we've got some red tape, I'd love to see the report on those 30% that, that were reduced. But I want to say there's three really important questions that you should ask going into this election and, and where your vote's going to be. Num number one, if you can't fire him, why would you hire him? We cannot have any government, doesn't matter which side of the spectrum they're on, that isn't accountable for 18 months or four years. If this uh, UCP government really cares about us and, and there's, it has the fear they say about the NDP, they would have passed recall that the day afterwards we could do something about it. Uh, it's unacceptable. Number two, you need to ask yourself, uh, are, are these parties and these individuals for carbon net zero? If they are, this is an opportunity to say no. This is where rural Alberta needs to stand up and say, well, maybe you woke city folk want to do that, but we're going to say no, and you need to elect someone like myself that will speak out about this. If no one speaks out, it will not stop. Our premier has said that, oh, this battle's over, we've lost it. Well, you haven't lost the battle till you quit. They have quit. They've said that we're going to do it by 2035. They're going to come up with all kinds of ideas for hydrogen. And the last one is, is a mandate from the people. We need a mandate from the people to collect the taxes here. We need a referendum saying, do you want to have the taxes collected here in Alberta by Albertans? These are positive steps that need to be taken so that we can stand up to Ottawa. And the best tool that you could give our premier if she's successful getting reelected is a Wild Rose MLA from rural Alberta that will make them better. She may be good, but she's not good enough without some Wild Rose opposition. Right now, all we see is the left pulling them off the, the trail and going into the ditch of socialism, spending money, subsidizing businesses, saying they're doing all these wonderful things. And what you need is much like Paul Martin had with the Reform Party. Quit spending the money. Paul Martin was the most fiscal responsible uh, finance minister. Why? Because he had opposition that was effective, Grant, and said quit spending money. Right now, opposition is pulling us um, into the ditch, and it's not acceptable. So I hope you'll consider myself, Paul Hinman, uh, in the next election and re-elect me because you'll have a strong voice that's accountable to you, the people. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hinman. Mr. Genther, please. When you go to vote this time, and I'll agree with Paul Hinman that this is a very important election, uh, I want you to think about Who's going to put you in front of their political career? Who's going to put you in front of their party and their party bosses? I've shown throughout my life that I'll do what it takes. I've fought and nearly died for this country before, and I will fight for the people of the Tabor Warner constituency. Well, thank you. Thank you to all our candidates. Let's uh, give them a big round of applause tonight. Not, not only for their honest and candid answers, but just making time to come here. I know they have a busy schedule leading up to the election. I know there is a, another forum uh, in the constituency here in Coaldale on Thursday night, and uh, they have lots of polls that take their time. So again, I appreciate them being here tonight. Just uh, in closing, uh, before we let you all go, again, just want to thank the Chamber for organizing this and putting this on and the hard work for them, for all of you coming, for caring enough to, to be here, for those that are watching at home or online for tuning in, and again, caring for uh, this area enough to be able to come, get informed, and be able to make the right decision. And again, on behalf of the Chamber, I would ask that you do that. Uh, be, be sure that you're getting all the information, become informed, and please get out and vote. So thank you for coming. Have a great night, and again, um, God bless everyone. Good night.